Well, here's a question for you. When you see somebody who's successful, do you think, ah, oh, they're just lucky? Or do you think they probably put a, a lot of hard work into it? Maybe that's just too simple a question. But that is the introduction for this week's History and Christianity podcast. Listen to this quote and see if you can relate. There are thoughtless and ignorant people who see only the apparent effects of things and not the things themselves. So they'll talk of luck, of good fortune, and chance. For example, seeing a man grow rich, they say how lucky he is. Observing another become an intellectual, they say how highly favored he is. And noting the saintly character and wide influence of another, they say how chance helps him at every turn. They don't see the trials and failures and struggles which these men have voluntarily encountered in order to gain their experience. They have no knowledge of the sacrifices they have made, of the undaunted efforts they have put forth, of the faith they have exercised that they might overcome the apparently insurmountable and realize the vision of their heart. They do not know the darkness and the heartaches. They only see the light and the joy and they call it luck. They don't see the long and arduous journey, but only behold the pleasant goal and call it good fortune. They don't understand the process. They only perceive the result and call it chance. Now I'm quoting from a book written in the late 1800s called As a Man Think It or James, by James Allen. Now, James Allen was born in England in 1864. At the age of 15, the tragic murder of his father left him as the family's sole breadwinner. He became a private secretary and continued until 1902, when at the age of 38, he devoted his life to writing. After publishing his first book, he retired to a coastal town, and then he wrote and lived in simplicity and he died in 1912. Now uh, James Allen is really a good historical source for any of the uh, motivational speakers that you hear in our day that uh, flavor their motivation with religious sounding words. Uh, James Allen was was no different. Listen how this was written back then. Tell me if it's still compelling in our day. The dreamers are the saviors of the world, Alan writes. As the visible world is sustained by the invisible, so men through all their trials and sins and sordid vocations are nourished by the beautiful visions of their solitary dreamers. Humanity cannot forget its dreamers. It cannot let their ideals fade and die. It lives in them. It knows them as they are realities, which it shall one day see and know. Composer, sculptor, painter, poet, prophet, sage, these are all the makers of the afterworld, the architects of heaven. The world is beautiful because they have lived. Without them, laboring humanity would perish. Cherish your visions. Cherish your ideals. Cherish the music that stirs in your heart, the beauty that forms in your mind, the loveliness that drapes your purest thoughts, for out of them will grow all delightful conditions, all heavenly environment. Of these, if you but remain true to them, your world will last, at last be built. To desire is to obtain, to aspire is to achieve, ask and receive. Dream your lofty dreams, and as you dream, so shall you become. Your vision is the promise of what you shall one day be. Your ideal is the prophecy of what you shall at last unveil. So uh, you picked up the, uh, the religious sounding words, the prophecy, um, ask and you shall receive. Um, again, a quote from uh, the New Testament. Um, uh, sin, uh, he talks about 
the spiritual world. Um, this book actually begins with a quote from Proverbs 23, verse 7. And again, the book is called As a Man Thinketh. But um, again, this was just a dated expression. He wasn't just referring to men when he wrote As a Man Thinketh. And here's proof. He wrote, I know a woman of 96 who has the bright, innocent face of a girl. I know a man well under middle age whose faith is drawn into inharmonious contours. The one, meaning the woman, is the result of a sweet and sunny disposition. The other is the outcome of passion and discontent. As you cannot have a sweet and wholesome abode unless you admit the air and sunshine freely into your rooms, so a strong body and a bright, happy, or serene countenance can only result from the free admittance into the mind of thoughts of joy and goodwill and serenity. So, this is about the impact of your thoughts on your life. And as I said, he begins his book with this quotation from the book of Proverbs. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. This is from Proverbs 23, verse 7. But actually what uh, <laughs> James Allen does is he misinterprets this proverb and he just runs with it. And now he's got some good ideas and so forth and the, the importance of effort and, and everything else. But as we'll see in a moment, he takes this portion of a, uh, a text from Proverbs and um, ignores the context and then uh, runs with it. And he's only interested in it insofar as his main goal of motivation because then he'll move into Buddhism and also some ideas of the Enlightenment. Recall that this is again uh, the late 1800s. So he is writing um, and uh, uh, as an eclectic book which borrows from many ideas. Uh, but insofar as this misinterpretation of Proverbs 23, he basically interprets that as saying that a man is literally what he thinks. So that becomes the basis for his insistence that the way to change your life is to change your thoughts. Um, but uh, this introduction to this book points out that the eclectic, the varied sources on which he makes this argument is clear when he turns almost immediately from familiar Judeo-Christian territory to quote um, uh, Buddha's teaching and then to quote even the Enlightenment. So um, his effort is really on uh, pragmatism, what's practical, what works. Um, the introduction notes, Alan is perhaps at the extreme, <clears throat> is at the extreme when he says simply that a man is what he thinks. But a more moderate version, insisting that thought may transform conditions rather than simply being formed by them, listen to this, is part of the bedrock of empirical investigation and scientific inquiry that is a legacy of enlightenment thinking. So as you can see, it didn't matter whether he got uh, Proverbs wrong, and uh, this is why he got it wrong, because there was enough in there to hold your interest, to be captivating enough, and to make you uh, inspired to uh, self-improvement. Uh, he quotes Proverbs 23, verse 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. The context is when you're eating with somebody who is a miser, who is a cheap uh, and greedy and wanting to be rich, it says, um, be, be careful because uh, don't eat with somebody who doesn't really have your interests at heart because he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So uh, it says, the morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up. So that's a quite a different picture. Uh, but the point is that this is the greedy one who, to be rich, Hoards his riches, withholding them from the poor and needy to keep and increase his own wealth. 
he invites someone to enjoy his courtesies, feigning generosity while really being sickeningly hypocritical as his real goal is to take advantage in some way so to increase his wealth at his guest expense. And of course, that is um, a uh, commentary and footnote of this particular uh, uh, Bible. And um, it is a book that if you haven't read, you should read. Uh, there were in stories uh, in history of uh, many young men in particular who read this book at that time and who found it motivating and uh, went out to view you know the world as their oyster but um, that is an idea though that is the the ideas inherent in there about uh, motivation is still very widely popular today I want to quote from a more recent book and listen in closely to what he says. Paul McCartney was 15 when John Lennon invited him to join a band. Joan of Arc was 18 when she led the French army to victory. Bill Gates was 19, 19 years old when he co-founded Microsoft. Plato was 20 when he became a student of Socrates. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was 33 years old when World War II broke out. He was lecturing in the United States, but he chose to return to Germany to lead fellow Christians against Hitler and the Nazis. Six years later, Bonhoeffer was executed at Flossenburg concentration camp just two weeks before the American soldiers liberated the camp. Joe DiMaggio was 26 when he hit safely in 56 consecutive games. Henry David Thoreau was 27 when he moved to the shore of Walden Pond, built a house, planted a garden, and began a two-year experiment in simplicity. Ralph Lauren was 29 when he created Polo. William Shakespeare was 31 years old when he wrote Romeo and Juliet. Thomas Jefferson was 33 when he helped write the Declaration of Independence. Mother Teresa was 40 years old when she founded the Missionaries of Charity. C.S. Lewis was 45 when he wrote Mere Christianity. Jack Nicholson was 46 when he shot 65 in the final round and 30 on the back nine to win the Masters. Henry Ford, Ford Motor Company, was 50 when he started his first manufacturing assembly line. Ray Kroc was 52-year-old milkshake machine salesman when he bought out Mac and Dick McDonald and officially started McDonald's. Pablo Picasso was 55 when he uh, began a new era in the arts. Uh, Winston Churchill was 65 when he became Britain's prime minister and went to war with Hitler. Nelson Mandela was 71 years old when he was released from 20 years in a South African prison. Four years later, he was elected president of South Africa. Uh, and I can go down here. John Glenn was 77 when he traveled into space. Benjamin Franklin was 79 years old when he invented bifocal eyeglasses. And this is quoting from a book by uh, Matthew Kelly, uh, The Biggest Lies in the History of Christianity. This too uh, is written by a man who would not be offended if you called him a motivational speaker. Uh, but he has a book here where he says, after he, uh, after he discusses several examples of people who've been successful, he says, why do I talk to you about these people? Most of them are not pursuing Christian excellence. So why do I mention them as our journey comes to an end? Be to remind us all that human beings, you and I, are capable of incredible things. But too often, we don't even scratch the surface of our capabilities. Too often, we get caught in the hustle and bustle of life. We fall into a daze and sleepwalk the rest of our way through life, or we think we're not among the special people and we're not capable of great things. But we are wrong. We are capable of great things. He says, and it turns out, people, our society, and the whole world, what they need is for you to realize this. Whether you're 16 or 116 years old, it doesn't matter. Make yourself 100% available to God and he will find a way to work powerfully through you. Your age 
is his problem. Now is your time. So, again, the book is The Biggest Lies in the History of Christianity. I didn't even touch what those lies were, but it certainly has a uh, spirit in the same vein of motivation that uh, goes way back in the history of um, America. And, and certainly James Allen isn't the first. There's others before him. But uh, certainly if you're going to read one of these, I recommend As a Man Think It because it is a classic and certainly something that uh, is worth reading in its entirety. So that's actually all I have for this week's podcast. Hope you found it informative. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.